Welcome in Jesus' name to this Friday series on Love Your Enemies. As we go through this series, we begin to understand the purpose and the plan of God and the mysteries of God in a way that will help us to understand the nature, the control, the power, the greatness of our God. As humans, we cannot stand the fact that we have enemy, we have an enemy or enemies that are always around in opposition in our life. But we forgot one thing, that God is in perfect control of every situation. You know how the Bible says that you can have faith to move mountains? Uh, and that's 1 Corinthians 13. And of course, in Mark 11, Jesus said that if you have faith, uh, if, you have this, if you have faith, you can speak to the mountain and the mountain shall be gone. And the other passages that talk about uh, faith moving mountains. So when did the mountain become your enemy? And for some people, your little hill is like a mountain. Maybe for some, it's a moor hill. And it's funny how uh, some people think that their enemy is that powerful and great when to some others will overcome greater things. It's just a mole hill and an hill. Or, you know, just a little backyard hill that somebody uh, put because there's a pile of sand over there. So, what was your mountain before? And uh, it seems like a, uh, your, your little hill looks like a big mountain and you don't really know what a real big mountain is. Who created the mountains and the hills? God. So since when did the mountain become your enemy? Why are there mountains and hills? Now those of us who live uh, in uh, places where you can climb mountains, you go for long walks uh, in the in the bush land or in a forest, you understand the beauty of the mountains and how great a view it can be from the mountains and you appreciate uh, the tallness of a mountain just as you ap appreciate the fertility of the valley and where the river flows. All these things were created by God and if you can understand the logic and the way of God you can understand that a being like God who is in perfect control over every power, authority and all existence itself has no qualms about opposition, enemies or things that oppose God. It tells us in the book of Psalm chapter 2 Starting from verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Now this is quoted, of course, in Acts 4 when the apostles were persecuted and they prayed and then as they prayed, the whole place was shaken and they were filled with the Spirit and they were filled with boldness. Here in Psalm chapter 2, verse 4, when God sees all this opposition and things that make themselves enemies of God, including Satan, the cohorts of all his hosts and fallen angels, and everything that fell with Satan, or of humans, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Look, he loves. The Lord shall hold them in the region. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure, in his deep, deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. To God, all this is nothing. And of course, it was so foolish for Satan to oppose God and try to replace God. I remember God is an uncreated being. 
He is the I am, the I am. We are the I am depending on the I am. So to God, literally, in a full sense, there is no enemy equal to him. And there can be no enemies. Because all, everything is his creation. The concept of just being an enemy of God is, is like lowering God to the level of a created being and then having an equal enemy against Him. There is no nothing. To God, to God, if, if, if this whole square of your frame of, uh, of this video is, let's say, you know, cover part of the uncreated, uh, part of the uncreated being. Creation will be just less than a dot, a pixel in your video screen. Less than that. Many, many times. And God lives in the uncreated. So it's, His creation is like one dot in an unlimited mass. It's just like a grain of sand in the ocean. And that one even is too big. A grain of sand is too big to compare. But for our sake of measurement, what is a grain of sand in a whole huge ocean? Nothing. And I would like for each one of us to see that. That because God is so great, so mighty, His enemy or people or angels who try to be the enemy of God is like nothing. Like Psalms 2 declares, sits on the throne and he laughs with amusement. What puny little created beings. He created us, he gave us life, he could snuff the life out of us. Right now, God could, in a wink and a snap of his finger or less than that, remove Satan everything that opposes him out of existence. That is how much power God has. So we many times never try to understand God, but try to understand Him today. Think about a being with unlimited, I mean unlimited power, and a being who actually gave life to the whole created universe and everything that is in it. Now to this being who is God, there is nothing that can oppose him. He could easily snuff existence out of his creation. Will he be nervous, affected, or be stressed out by Enemies or things that oppose him, even his creation oppose him, will he be stressed out? No, not at all. But this being, our Almighty God and Father, understood that for his created beings to progress, to stretch himself, to understand Him, they must experience free choice and they must experience difficulty and they must experience things that oppose them for one simple reason, that they may grow and be even better and better than what they were before they had an enemy. If you have no enemies in your life and everybody loves you, your whole life is a song, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, that no one can deny. Right? That's your whole life. I don't think you progress much. 
The history of mankind shows that the greatest developments are when we compete and when there's an opposition. Did you know that in our modern world and civilization, I mean, ancient civilization might have a technology that are lost to us, but in a modern civilization, the aircraft was only invented at the beginning of the 20th century, early 1900s. The Wright brothers flew for a few minutes. Within 70 years, in 1969 or so, we land a man on the moon in a rocket. That was extremely fast progress in flight. How is that possible? Part of the advancement and the design of aircraft was greatly expedited because of the war. We suffered World War I, World War II, or which, again, I say, it's terrible moments of tragedy in mankind with millions of people who died. And the competition between the USSR at that time and USA to get go to the moon first expedited the development of rockets. Sometimes the motivation for inventing something is evil. The first rockets that were built, besides those from China and the gunpowder, but the, the, the big ones the, were the Germans, the V1, V2. And when the Second World War ended, every country wanted the rocket scientists to develop rocket science. And so rocket development went on from one phase to another until we landed a man on the moon. Today, we want to send people to Mars. All this was possible because of competition and because of survival and because of warfare. The original invention of it by the Germans, V1, V2, was to destroy but in the end can be used for good and for exploration. And it came with a jet engine, from the little propellers to the jet engine. But today, a plane can fly with, in a sense, rockets as the engine, and uh, turbine engines that in the shape of a rocket propulsion, and they can fly faster than speed of sound. Mark 1, Mark 4, Mark 5. All these were expedited through competition. Without competition and without an enemy, I doubt they would develop that. In fact, when you read the history of the Korean War, at that time, the US was, after the war, did not realize that the Soviet Union continued to develop in uh, plane technology. And then when they begin to see the MiG fighters coming, they realize we better spruce up on our, our planes, otherwise we cannot compete. <coughs> and so the development of more and more complex and versatile planes to fight air battles. And it is very strange it seems that resistance, opposition, or the concept of an enemy is a necessity to our progress. Without a Goliath, there is no David in his prime. Without the 
different oppositions that people endure. Their goodness of their character might not be able to come forth. And I remember one example. When David was in the wilderness with his uh, mighty man, 400 odd mighty man, he used to guard the shepherds or the people. And then when it came time for them to be rewarded, or they would ask for some uh, handout. So Nabal refused to give David anything. And, Dave, and he became an enemy of David. I, he became an enemy of David. He said, who is David? Let me show you the scriptures. There is this story of David and Nabal. And his wife was, uh, of course, Abigail. It says in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 2, Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. And the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He definitely can spare some. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal. This is actually not a good name. And the name of his wife, Abigail. And for the sake of uh, looking deeper into that, I don't know why he was named Nabal, or maybe uh, looking back, they call him a Nabal, because Nabal means a fool. He's a fool. And Abigail, uh, from the Hebrew word Ab uh, Abigail, or Abigail, um, means um, source of joy. So here's the situation. The name of the man was Nabal, or fool, name of his wife Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his doing. He was of the house of Caleb. You know, what a good ancestry, and he's a bad guy. And um, uh, David didn't make him his enemy. David treated him like a friend. But he made himself the enemy of David. In verse 4, 1 Samuel 25, verse 4, when David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent 10 young men. And David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal. Greet him in my name. See, they sought peace. They want to be friends. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. So David regarded Nabal as a friend. Unknown to David, Nabal regarded David as an enemy. Isn't that strange? And after the young man were to greet him in verse 7, it says, Now I heard, they were to say to him, Now I heard that your shearers, your shepherds were with us. We did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them. All the while they were in Carmel. Remember that in those days, they're always robbers, they're always uh, invaders, they're always skimmers or bad people who come to steal and uh, take the flock. And David always protected them. And it says here, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Verse 8. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes. For we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. Yeah, David regarded himself, you know, as a uh, uh, take me as your son, I'll take care of you. Uh, we have been protecting you. So David regarded as, as, as his friend and as family. Ha. So when David's young men came and they spoke to Nabal, according to all these words in the name of David, and then they waited. 
and this Nabal chose to make himself an enemy of David. David didn't ask for that. David treated him as a friend. David treated him as family. In verse 10, then Nabal answered David's servant and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master, implying that David used to serve King Saul, now he had broken away. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my surest and give it to men when I do not know where they are from? Wow, oh, he's rude. He might not know the story behind David and Saul. Just like many people, they don't know the stories behind relationships or, or broken relationships or things that have happened and they always make assumptions. I tell you, if David was a captain with Saul, this man would respect. See, this man doesn't respect people. He only respects positions. And such people are not good. Because then you come across someone with no position, or a beggar, then you treat them rudely. No, it's a terrible person. <coughs> you only look at the outward things. So here, if David were famous and powerful, and, or, or, and, and uh, if he had the king's authority or favor, then he regarded him. No king's favor, he reject David. Oh my, what a bad man. So he answered rudely and sent the man away. Verse 12, so David's young men turned on their heels and went back. And they came and told him all these words. Then David said to his men, Every man gird on his sword. In other words, we're going fighting. We're going to slaughter. So every man girded on his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went with David. And 200 stayed with his supplies. So altogether he had 600 men. 400 men rode on their horses and they came. Verse 14, one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them, he treated them rudely. David came as a friend and as a family, says you know, your son David. But he reviled them. You know, to revile is... Something that any godly Christian should never do. That's why you should love your enemies. Because you should never revile them, treat them badly. Only the devil treat people like that. And only people with the nature of the devil. We are never to revile anyone. He reviled them. But the men were very good to us. And we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the field. They were a wall to us both day and night. All the time we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what you will do. For harm is the determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seeds of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisin, 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, Go on before me. See, I'm coming after you. Now with so much, you, you think this would be several donkeys. You cannot fit it all one donkey. So there was a whole caravan of donkeys. And she says to the servant, Go, go, go ahead. See, I'm coming after you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. So it was as she rode on the donkey that she went down under the cover of the hill. And there were David and his men coming with a sword, marching in formation to kill and to wipe out Nabal because he was rude to David. He made himself an enemy of David and David is about to kill him. So when she met David and his men coming down to her, she met them. In verse 21, David had said, Surely in vain I protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him. He has repaid me evil for good. 
May God do so and more also to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. In other words, he was going to slaughter. And this is Old Testament, remember. He's going to slaughter all of Nabal and kill every man who were there. The servants were in danger too. And it's warfare time. And uh, so you, you have uh, such times that were there. Of course, these are not New Testament times. These are Old Testament times. And verse 23, When Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. So she took a humble approach. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel. <laughs> oh my. Uh, you know it's a scoundrel. Let's see what's the Hebrew word. Scoundrel. Um, it's an unusual. A man as an individual. Um, it says uh, one who is supposed to be uh, with good potential and um, essentially uh, supposedly like a mighty man um, but apparently one who used all his might for bad for evil for as his name is so is he his name is a fool and he is a fool Nabal is his name and folly is with him but I your maidservant did not see the young man of my lord whom you sent now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, see the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed, from avenging yourself with your own hand. Now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord. See, she recognized that he is swallowing the Lord. And evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. See, she knows the story of Saul. She knows that David was running away because Saul tried to kill him. But Nabal, he doesn't know. So she knows all these things. She says, Yet a man has reason to pursue you, seek your life. But the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies you shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to the good that he has spoken concerning you, has appointed you ruler of Israel. She also know that he is anointed to be ruler over Israel. That one day he's going to be king. That this will be no grief to you, no offence or heart to my Lord, either that he has shed blood without cause, or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. You know what was happening here? David was going to shed blood. But this blood is avenged, and this is also not in warfare blood shed. Nabal may have Curse him, say the wrong things about him, but he did not raise a sword to try to kill David. So he's not in a battle. So Abigail actually says, Look, I know that it's unjust what you're going through. A man tried uh, you're running because someone seek your life. That's King Saul. I know you're anointed to be king. One day you will be king. So don't do this today because in the future you will regret what you have done today by taking revenge and killing Nabal and all the young men. So David answered, Blessed, he says to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. 
For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you hurry and come to me, surely by morning light, no males will be left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she has brought him and said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice, respected your person. David was prevented from bloodshed. So he followed her advice and he turned back after receiving all the gifts. Here's an interesting story. David thought that Nabal was his friend and his family. But Nabal treated David as an enemy. And David came to slaughter Nabal and every young man with him. He says by the morning, it will only be lady servants left because everyone will be slaughtered. In this situation, David was pushed when he made the right decision. If he made the wrong decision, of course, it's horrible. David was pushed to find a better part of himself. Under his normal self of a warrior, he would have slaughtered Nabal and all the male pe- males in the house. And that would be Old Testament, that would be okay, you know, people kill, people get killed. But because now he is an enemy, and he has to learn to treat the enemy in a more compassionate way, and let God deal with his enemy, and don't deal with the enemy by his own hand. So he was asked to take the higher ground. And when he took the higher ground, God acted. That day itself when Abigail came to tell Nabal while he was feasting and eating and he was drunk. And so she didn't say anything until the morning. She told him in the morning what would happen to him. He apparently, his heart turned to stone and he died. And he says in verse 38, it happened after about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. So when he heard it, he probably was seized. He got some sort of, his heart might be seized. And 10 days later, he died. So God took revenge. God got, got rid of David's enemies. Something good happened here. David moved from a good man to become a better man. See, enemies are allowed by God. You got to, you got to see that enemies are not mountain or anything. They, they exist because God permit them to exist so that you and I can become a better person when we react with more compassion and more love. We, can, we become better people. If we, if we treat them in a normal human way, hate your enemies, love your friends, we have not grown in our character. And I would say, God who created the mountains and the hills who created difficult, who allowed difficulties and situation, God who allowed the devil to continue existing when he can wipe him out, God who allowed evil to continue on this earth and many suffered, he knows. He himself, of course, is almighty and not affected by anything or any enemy. But he knows that those who want to be like him will have an opportunity to become better people, to become a higher person like him, to enter into a higher place in their character, in their attributes, because of the presence of enemies. 
So we have here a small understanding of why God allowed evil to continue. Because it is the only way for us to find our better selves, our higher ground. It's the only way for us to become more like Jesus. See, it was eye for eye, teeth tooth for tooth until Jesus came. When Jesus came, He showed to all creation a new way to fight against your enemy. By absorbing all their evil and turning into good, rather than eye for eye, tooth for tooth the new and the living way. And in doing that, he rose higher than could ever be imagined. We see here the mystery of why evil is permitted. The answer is very simple and staring you in the face. Although it's hard to stomach. It's that Enemies exist, difficulties exist because God knew that through this experience, through experiencing having enemies, through experiencing having difficulties or opposition, we will become stronger and better people. It's the only way we can learn. It's the school of hard knocks. When you forgive an enemy, when you rise to the level where you say that you will not return evil for evil, even if your enemy return evil for good, you will return good for evil. Then you can become like Christ then the revelation of Christ can come into your life when you return good for evil. That is pure New Testament. God has been waiting for a long, long while to bring mankind to the higher level of Christ. In the old days of the Old Testament, he, uh, he, he knew all this was bad. Slavery, uh, the low position of women, uh, r revenge, uh, eye for eye, two for two. All this he knows is part of the natural world, but they are not part of his higher and greater revelation. These are all low things that happen. God has always wanted to reveal the path of Christ, the way of Christ, and how mankind can rise to the highest level all the time. That is why when Jesus came, He suddenly went further than the Old Testament. He said, in the Old Testament, this is it. But in the New Testament, this is how high you should go. In the Old Testament, this is it. In the New Testament, this is how further you should go. When Christ came, He revealed God. He revealed not just laws to live by. He revealed the nature, the true nature of God. Of course, God has to sit on the throne and judge. But that's not His full heart and nature. The full heart nature of God is to forgive and to love. And I believe out of this situation, David became a better person. And as he kept on walking in this path, remember there was another time when King Saul was pursuing him and he went to the cave to relieve himself. David was in a cave and David cut off part of his rope. It says David's heart was so sensitive that his heart smote him. Let's look at that incident. 
This is an uh, incident before Nabal in 1 Samuel chapter 24. It tells us here when Saul was chasing after David to pursue and kill him. See, everyone should know that David was running for his life. That's why Abigail knew about it. When you see the king coming with soldiers to chase only one person. And uh, surprise that Nabal doesn't know that. And in verse 4, it says here, 1 Samuel 24, verse 4, Then the man of David said to him, when uh, the king was in the recesses of the cave, he said, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him, because he cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Now, there's many opportunities here. David had a prophecy that he would be king. Saul was king. David had an opportunity to kill him but did not. In fact, when he cut off a piece of his, a piece of his rope, he felt that he should not do it. A higher part of him fell. He should not. Now, this Old Testament, eye for eye, two for two. A man who tried to kill you, you can find and kill him. And he actually stopped his men from killing Saul. Because his men were killed for David. David did a good thing. Because by doing so, he showed that some level of a higher self. Remember, God saw a man who is after his own heart. This is a man who God loves. I believe when, when he holds himself back, from killing Saul, some part of David became higher and better. Why do enemies exist? Why do God permit enemies? In order for you to become more like Christ, to find the higher nature of God in you and rise to be a better person than your enemy. If somebody barks at you, don't bark back because you become a dog like the other person. You remain on the higher ground. You repay evil with good. You keep treating people with respect even if they don't treat you with respect. And as you keep on doing it, you become a better person. Think about it. What is life? What do we take out from this life? You cannot take your position in this life because there are only positions on the earth. You cannot take your silver and your gold and all your material goods. You cannot take anything from this life. The only thing you take from this life is your experience and who you have become. A better person or a more terrible person. When you look around at the world today, you ask yourself, why are some people evil and bad? Is because of the total experiences that they have. I don't think and I believe that every human being is born innocent, even though they have seen nature. They might have a tendency based on their ancestry and weaknesses towards different things. But every child is born innocent. Then why do some people grow into bad adults? And bad people, killing, maiming, destroying people. Why? Because whatever experience they had, they keep 
on responding incorrectly. And with each experience, they reinforce their wrong behavior. And over a period of time, they become the person that they are. <clears throat> Let's say a person who kills easily. Maybe the first time the person kills, they are very troubled and it could be by anger or accident. Then after that, every time the person is angry, he starts killing. After a thousand times of anger and killing, the person is like the devil. So what has become of the person when the person dies? Dragged to hell and such a person cannot go to heaven unless he's born again and changed. So experiences can make us better people or worse people. The sad news is that you cannot come up the same way. In life, all of us receive different experiences, good and bad. But no matter how bad they are, you have a free choice to choose how you behave and what you do. Of course, you might make mistakes, get over it and push on. One mistake doesn't make you a failure. Doesn't mistake doesn't make you a failure. You're only a failure if you don't keep improving yourself. <coughs> But as you find your more spiritual self, your more compassionate self, the better person that is in you, the more godly person, and let the more godly person in you respond correctly according to Christ, then the nature of Christ becomes reinforced into you. And at the end of your life on earth, voila, you have become Christ-like. But if you respond incorrectly, oh, oh, you become like the devil. So strip of all our positions, strip of all our riches, strip of all that cloth us on this earth and material things. Who are we? We are the person of whose character we have become. So God allows enemies and He teaches us how to have a heart like His to respond according to Jesus' Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount. Someone slaps you, you give him the other cheek, you don't slap back. Someone punches you, you don't punch back. Someone insults you, do you don't insult back. You do not repay evil with evil. To Christ, you learn to repay evil with good. And one day, when you look into the mirror, you have become like Christ. So as we learn, this series about loving our enemies. Let us, number one, accept the fact that just as there are mountains and hills, and sometimes the mountains are benefit, is a mount of transfiguration, sometimes the mountains are a hindrance in front of you, and you go to exercise faith to move the mountains. You live in a world where there are many types of humans. Some are good, some are bad. Some will become your enemies without you choosing. Some will remain good people, good friends. Whatever it is, however you are treated, choose the Christ way. So number one, accept that in this life, you will have enemies just like in this life, there are rough seas, smooth seas, mountains and valleys. Accept it. That. And how you can accept it is to understand 
that they exist for our benefit to grow. God could easily get rid of every mountain and hill, make the whole land as flat as flat can be. God could get rid of the devil and all the enemies in an instant and they don't exist like in a millennium. But even in the millennium, you know what happened? After a thousand years without a single existence or entity of evil, because the devil himself was locked away, the humans who are good and the humans who are bad are not differentiated yet. Because at the end of 1,000 years when Satan was released for a short time, the bad are still bad, the good are still good. When Satan went to tempt the whole world at the end of 1,000 years to fall, some people still fall. Why? Because they were never really tested. They seem to be good, but they're not good. You are only truly good and tested as a tree when you could choose to be bad, choose to be evil, you choose to be good and you choose to be Christ-like. Then you're tested. Then you bear fruit. So don't trust whether people are good and bad when they are not tested yet. Watch how they behave when they have enemies and they have bad things happen. So God, in His divine wisdom, created a path of growth for us that include having mountains and hills, having enemies and friends. Accept that as your life and a part of this life in order for us to grow, to become better people, at the end of the thousand years, when the good people were tested and they still remain with God, what does it prove? It proved that they were actually by nature good. For a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. And the bad, by nature, they were just still bad. Just because they don't do something and no opportunity to do something doesn't mean they were good. Only the situation proves it. So number one, accept that in life there are mountains and there are hills and there will be enemies and friends. Live with it and understand that God allow it for you to become a better person. God allow it for you to find a Christ nature in you. Number two, always choose the response of Christ. Do what Jesus do. Don't do what Jesus wouldn't do. As you keep choosing how Christ will respond, don't even follow Old Testament people who don't follow 100%. Don't follow your friends or justify your behavior or your, even your parents or your forefathers. Follow only Christ and Christ's behavior. Don't follow your leaders who might be doing the wrong thing. Follow only Christ. It's our opportunity. Good people come, good people go. Bad people come, bad people go. Sometimes they are leaders. Sometimes they are around us. Sometimes they are near, sometimes they are far. At the end of the day, we all had the freedom to choose good and evil. We had the freedom to choose whether we be Old Testament people or New Testament people. Choose Christ. And allow that situation to mold you and make you become a better person. Always choose Christ. Let Christ in you rise. We don't have the strength in ourselves. But Christ in us has the strength. In any situation, spend time in prayer, wait upon God. If you are upset, cool down first. Whatever situation, take no actions in the midst of your temper or in the midst of uncontrol. Cool down. 
Find some peace and quiet. Pray in tongues. Wait on God for one hour. Read the Bible. Meditate. Do something that brings you in the presence of God. And then, let Christ in you rise to do the New Testament thing. To love your enemies. To bless those who curse you. To repay evil done to you with goodness. And forever, goodness and mercy will follow you. And God will always prepare a table before you. And every day you see the goodness of the Lord. Isn't Christ our example? Whatever happens, Christ responds correctly. And He was provided for all His life. God protected and shielded Him all His life. If you want the protection of God, then you surrender your protection to God. You don't have to protect yourself. Let God protect you. I know it's vulnerable when you choose to love. But it's important to keep choosing love against hate. Keep choosing love. Keep choosing the path of peace. Keep choosing the path of joy and harmony. And at the end of the day, you will become a better person. So the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. Lord, live up His countenance upon you and give you peace every single day of your life, every single hour, every single minute. In Jesus' name, Amen.